Good afternoon, teachers, and welcome back. Uh, it's nice to have you back on a Saturday afternoon and welcome Dale as well. And this is our integrated skills in English exam, which is known as ISC. Um, and this is a little bit new to our Sri Lankan market. So um, I implore you to sort of take a look at this syllabus and Dale is going to give us an overview. I think most of you are um, familiar with our Jesse exams, which is the graded exams in spoken English. This is the more comprehension, comprehensive version of the English language exams, right, Trinity? Dale, uh, I'm going to leave it to you to explain and go over the ISC syllabus in more detail. Yeah, thanks, Renu. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome back. It's, uh, believe it or not, four weeks in a row. Some would say we're going steady, and that's a good thing. All right. Um, so as we get started this afternoon on um, looking through the integrated skills in English, I thought I'd share with you um, a couple of links if you want to download a syllabus or you want to keep it handy or you want to do that a little later. Um, of course, I will in the mail to follow post um, this session this afternoon. Um, you, I will send you all the links where you can further explore this in your own time as well. So on that note, let's begin. Um, today, this afternoon, and this is what we're going to be looking at in general. We're talking about education and skills. Trinity and skills, um, Trinity and a little bit about the testing philosophy. Uh, we're also gonna look at the integrated skills in English and have an overview and its application to the real world. And finally, the most important and interesting thing is how are these exams constructed? And then of course, we will also look at um, the recognition of these exams uh, in various parts of the world. So let's start. I, if you've joined us in the earlier webinars, you know that I would have spoken about something like this, wherein, um, and this is definitely uh, true for India, as I'm sure it's true for a lot of uh, countries in the world, is there is sometimes a disconnect between what we study in schools and what the workplace requires out of us. And this particular um, graphic would kind of highlight um, how um, we celebrate academic success very often in the form of uh, standardized test scores, um, and yet when these younger people come into the workplace of the workforce, um, sadly they found to be very lacking. And this is cause um, for pause um, to think a little bit about what we're doing as educators, as uh, parents, as guardians of society, of what the next level ought to be and how can we better prepare our young learners for that future. So hence, um, from experience, we've seen that, uh, and this is not, I'm sure there's a lot of written experience on this, but this is also a quite uh, a common sense as well. We often see people in contemporary workplaces climbing up that ladder um, or the proverbial ladder um, very often because they have that extra, call it what you want, chutzpa or your uh, skill comp uh, quotient or your ability to navigate to the workplace better and so on. And in the context of what, if one had to put a label to that, it's basically the whole context of skills, communication skills and various other 21st century skills. Now, of course, in the earlier three webinars, we've discussed these at length and um, Renu would have shared with you all those video links as well um, for you to um, always have a look at what we discussed earlier. But, the point I'm trying to make today is that in, in the world in which we live, there are two aspects. There's one which is education, conventional education, which is more about learning stuff or the amount of knowledge you have or the things you know. And then of course comes the part of, okay, now that I know, what can I do with it? And this is where skills really comes in. So skills in that context is really the ability to do something well. So, and I think in this changing world, where a few industries that we see are the main industries today in the world, whether it's artificial intelligence or nanotechnology or uh, biomedicine, or even the, um, uh, the rising to the next level, whether it's in the arts and the humanities, um, all comes from not just how much you know, but what can you do? How can you make the sub subject relevant? And hence it's important that when we talk about young learners' success, 
Um, it's based on the acquisition of two things, knowledge and skills. Hence, we must have the ability to know and to do. So with that as a background, and I want to talk to you a little bit about Trinity and our learnings over these last 140 odd years, um, having worked with learners in almost 68 countries um, and almost as many as a million of them every year who come up and take assessments. We've seen that essentially for success, this is what students need academically, socially, culturally, and professionally. They need to develop that sense of confidence. They need to have language skills. Um, they need to have transferable skills and they need to have study strategies. Now, we have also in the past considered um, various um, versions of these skills in the context of communication skills. Today, we're gonna to have a look at it in a little more depth in the context of the world of work with the language of English. <coughs> Please excuse me, uh, <clears throat> have a bit of a bad throat. Uh, I've also shared with you uh, an image like this in the earlier webinars, which basically spoke about how do we build this holistic pathway for young learners to develop all these four skills. So it starts usually at the ages of three, where we look at building confidence, and thereafter we look at rooting their language in an oral uh, way. The, um, and then from the age of seven onwards, we look at developing additional skill sets because of the age at which children are, and there's so much more creativity happening in their lives. And then finally, from the age of 11 onwards, we look at building proficiencies, which are gonna help these young learners academically, professionally, socially, through reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And that is where a lot of today's discussion is gonna happen. Now, that very same holistic pathway when benchmarked against the various offerings that Trinity has is these following suites that we have very often going tandem with one another or running parallelly with one another. So many of you already know that in drama, we use the young performance certificate. And then from the age of five onwards, we use the graded exams in spoken English uh, which has 12 grades. Um, and then from the age of about seven onwards, we start with communication skills and speech and drama and performance arts and so on. And then of course, from the age of 11 onwards, we start with the integrated skills in English. So hence teachers, today's talk and discussion is all about how can we use this to empower learners from the ages of 11, 12 and onwards. So on that, one must also keep in mind that our history as an examination board is very, very deep in these areas. We're the only ones who really are king size, so to speak, in all of these uh, five areas that you see listed on your screen. Which brings us to talking a little bit about how is Trinity sustained? How has Trinity remained that guiding force for this entire assessing industry? And that comes a lot from this one picture that you see over here is firstly, we believe that every uni, every child and every learner is unique. All of them have different abilities and we always know this, we say this as parents uh, and we certainly see this as teachers. Uh, but the question is that if that is the case, then it's, it's important that we do the next thing, which is give all our children a test which is based on their ability. All right, as you can see, this graphic makes reference to a test in which uh, the judge or the examiner is asking all the different animals over here um, to see if they can climb the tree as the test. And undoubtedly, you notice very closely that you have a seal, a fish, uh, a penguin uh, in that lot. And needless to say, they're never ever going to be able to climb that tree, which is a cause for, um, for us to reflect as to are we giving our learners tests and are we giving them experiences that get them to learn and show their learning authentically or are we putting a test before them for the sake of a test and if it's truly a good test then all stakeholders require a framework to analyze critically evaluate or design and develop test tasks and that is why the trinity's um, approach and the unique syllabi in each of the subject areas are designed around learning outcomes and assessment criteria. And these are further determined uh, or differentiated 
by the attainment bands. So in a nutshell, a lot of our testing philosophy is about how can you make yourself relevant in what you're learning to the world around you. And hence, what we should be setting for you as tests or exam tasks should be building on that ability to build from there. As you look at this slide, I think you'll understand <clears throat> that for us, it's more about what you can do. So knowledge is one part, but skills is the other part. S knowledge, of course, can be gleaned through the various uh, technologies we have, which empower Google and all the encyclopedias. And in a matter of a moment, you may have the knowledge at your fingertips, but can skill be developed that way? No, it takes time. And chances are for you to be really skillful, you need both knowledge and skills. But if you're to be measured, then it's going to be skills alone. Now, <clears throat> moving from there, I'd like to spend a little, a uh, few moments talking to you about the integrated skills in English by first giving you an overview of, this, of the suite and then talking a little bit about the various aspects of the assessment. So, this is an English related exam, okay, which means that we are testing the parametric, the parameters of the English language, uh, and more importantly, the certificate that is awarded mentions the level of English proficiency. So um, the exam per se is designed essentially to assess and to build on the communicative skills that are required for the 21st century. This is a little bit about the various um, um, highlights of our assessment. Um, it was born out of an institution or research body known as CRELA, which is the Center for Research Excellence in uh, Language Assessment. Um, there's also the CEFR banding, which applies to it. There's the ALT, A-L-T-E-Q band that is given to our assessments. And most importantly, it is an exam which is banded and not sliding. And when I say that, I mean, we are looking to assess the particular uh, attributes or qualifying can-do statements of a particular band. So if you score more than that, that's great. But if you score less than that, does not mean automatically that you are at a lower level. So hence, choice of the particular level of the assessment becomes very, very important. Um, additionally, and this, there's a lot of research that you can look at on Trinity's website, this assessment uh, had a lot of key collaborators, including the University of Bedfordshire, where Crella is based, uh, as well as Lancaster University for their language corpus. Now, the ISE exam basically covers these four skills, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And like I said earlier, the purpose of any test Right in the ideal world, and the ISC assessment is really very helpful in that regard. Is it should measure three things: is it it should measure proficiency, and that is how good are you at it. It should also be about describing what level of achievement you've had vis-a-vis -vis other standards that exist uh, around the world, and most importantly, a true test should also just not applaud you, but should also tell you where you did really well and where you perhaps could do better. So having a diagnostic is also very, very important. Now, you remember I said earlier that it's all about building communicative skills, okay? In that context, I wanna posit this image before you because when one talks about language and language acquisition and language usage, we must look at it in the context of one being able to use it in a variety of scenarios. So hence, we use the term communicative competence. It's not just about the linguistic competence, which typically would talk about prosody and lexis and um, grammar, uh, but it's also about the social linguistic competence. That is the audience where you're gonna be using or interacting with in your everyday course of language usage. And so do you must also have the ability to have strategic and discourse competence. So all of these firstly are merged into the ISE. Now the ISE exam or the 
uh, integrated skills in English really covers four different levels. And there is a fifth one beyond this level, but it starts at the, at the level or the CEFR level of A2, which is typically where a lot of children's language would be at about the age of 10, 11, uh, thereabouts. Of course, this um, would vary based on the board of education and the medium of instruction. Um, and hence we say that this is the right age for children to be introduced to ISE. So we have these four levels, ISE Foundation, then we have ISE 1, 2, 3, and we also have an ISE 4. Now, the reason why we've not listed ISE 4 over here is because that follows a different format. And maybe at some later point in time when you do need it, I'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. But for now, this is what you need to know. There is a reading and writing module, and there is a speaking and listening module. And I'm gonna talk about this in a little more detail. So essentially it's an assessment that covers reading, writing, and speaking and listening. The reading and writing uh, module uh, happens over the course of two hours. It's a physical sit down written exam and the speaking and listening uh, varies based on the relevant grade. So it could be as little as 13 minutes. It could be as much as 25 minutes. Now, because this is a modular exam, you get a modular certification, which means that reading and writing has a modular certificate. Speaking and listening has a modular certificate. And when you complete both those modules, you then get the certificate of the level. So you may do, and sometimes we see this, that someone has done, let's say, a reading and writing now, and maybe after six months has done the speaking and listening component. So you can split the modules as well. Um, and as a result of which, it's when you complete the second module that you will have a chance to say, this is my overall proficiency in, this, in both these modules, but uh, demonstrated through this one qualification. And of course, like a lot of our other assessments, there are four attainment bands. There's distinction, merit, pass, and fail. So just to explain this a little further, these are the modular certificates. On the extreme left-hand corner, you'd see module one, which is speaking and listening. And below that, you'd see the reading and writing module, which leads to the certificate of the level. So in this case, it's an IC3. And if you look very closely, it mentions CEFR level C1, which is the second highest level you can achieve in language proficiency, C2 being the highest. So just to quickly recap that, there are six levels. There's A2. So there's A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. Our ISE assessments start at A2. So we start the level um, already a little higher than the A1, which hence we started at A2. Um, now, when we were to look a little closer at how this applies to the real world, then you need to keep in mind the following things. And this requires you to think a little bit as I talk you through this. So the IRC assessment reflects real-time transferable skills, including learning strategies, study skills, professional skills, all right, and interpersonal skills, okay? How does this happen? Well, firstly, we use a very common sense approach. When do you speak without listening? So normally a lot of language exams require you, they have a writing task and they will straight away give you an impetus, all right, to write. Or very often um, they may just have a speaking task. But in the real world, you need to keep these things in mind, all right? We often speak only after listening. In fact, we often say that we've been given two ears and one mouth so that we listen twice as much and speak half as much, all right? Which is good practice, I think, in general for any young learner to acquire is think before you speak. And also, when do you write without reading? So like I mentioned, if I give you a writing task, chances are you would want to do a little bit of research before that. And that's the real world in which we live in. Just giving you a random writing task in itself is one way, but the very often in the context of the workplace and the academic kind of work that we do, we need to read a lot and then we need to produce our own authentic writing very often based on what we've been reading. So hence those itself are a set of skills that we need to acquire. So keeping that in mind, you must also know this, 
is that the listening part of our assessment, when you are talking, discussing with an examiner, is subjectively assessed, which means it's in, it, there is no computer checking. It is someone physically listening, a qualified examiner listening to you. And actually this particular level or the whole ISC suite from the ISC one grade and above is, a, is considered a very, very um, um, reputed assessment that it goes through checking twice uh, by examiners. So hence, um, it's, it's not only subjectively assessed, but it's often twice scored or examiners look at it um, in, for two different examiners look at it. And similarly, the reading into writing is also subjectively assessed because it's only when I've read something that I can write it and you as an examiner having read it can then on that basis also help understand what I have written. So these two components are very, very important because today one sees a lot of language testing happening around the world uh, and there are a variety of different um, operators uh, who offer language exams. And all that scoring is done through a lot of computer modeling and artificial intelligence. And while that's also a way to do it, um, subjectively assessing basically means that we're not, we still have the human element involved in this assessment um, because this is truly an, an assessment that combines a lot of human skills. Uh, just as a matter of interest, I should also mention this, that the reason why the ISC assessment is so heavily regarded the world over is because it is the most, um, it's an exam which involves the most cognitive processes of the mind simultaneously when one is doing an assessment like this. And that says a lot because it means that we are able to tap into different areas of the brain, all right, which we engage with or you engage with as a learner and consequently as a user. Now, I come circling back to this image that you saw a little earlier. We spoke of language competence and we, we spoke of language skills, transferable skills and study strategies as the 21st century or transferable skill sets that people need to have. So when one talks of language skills, all right, we need to look very closely at what does this include? So if you remember that little drawing I showed you, which spoke of communicative competence, it requires linguistic skills, that is grammar, vocab, syntax, prosody, and phonology, but it also requires social linguistic skills, discourse skills, and strategic skills. So that's one element that's part of this assessment. The second part is developing transferable skills. Now, in my earlier webinars, from, a, from the context of communication, I specifically showed you how at page seven of the communication skills syllabus, there was a list of transferable skills mentioned that are also the employability skills that are addressed through that syllabus. But in the context of this syllabus, all right, it helps build out these um, various uh, transferable skills as well critical thinking and problem solving because the kind of tasks that you're given would require that. It would require collaboration, agility and adaptability, um, effective oral and written communication and so on and so forth. Now, it's important to point this out because if you remember what I mentioned also earlier is that the most important criteria that employers are looking at today is your skill profile, all right? We used to use the word IQ a lot in the days gone by but of course, there've been a lot of studies, some which even suggest that IQ is directly um, inversely proportioned to the emotional quotient, all right? So hence, having a high IQ is not always such a good thing, all right? In fact, today having good EQ or good skill Q or the skill quotient is also very, very important. Now, this is an interesting thing is this particular assessment helps build study strategies. Now, I understand when we talk of study in many parts of the world, it's normally about knowing which chapter, which page number, and trying to commit it to memory so that it can be perhaps reproduced on paper a few hours later in the form of an exam. But how is that really studying? In fact, then it becomes more a test of your memory and has very little to do with really studying or applying uh, the acquisition of knowledge. So this particular assessment requires you to do some note-taking, 
summarizing, synthesizing, looking at different material and working it out, sourcing relevant data across texts. And I'm gonna talk to you about this in a few minutes. Uh, how to plan your work, self-checking and self-evaluation, deducing and inferring. Now, why does this become so important? Because in the real world, this is what you are required to do every day in the workplace. And even if you're a master's candidate or studying to do your post-graduation, you need to be able to do this. And then the question that arises is, how much of this are we learning in our current education system? If you are, you're lucky, you're blessed, you're privileged. But the truth is we oftentimes do not spend time on developing these skills. And this is why it's important that learners learn this so that they can use this in wherever else they go, whether it's in their workplace, all right, because you can be very sure if you're a manager or managing director, you very often need to read multiple reports to be able to create your own uh, pathway going forward. Hence, you need to have all these skill sets in place. And this assessment truly helps build up those and also helps us understand how you've been using those. So in a nutshell, all right, this is what our test would reflect. Uh, language skills, transferable skills, and study strategies as well. So in summary, uh, we know what skills students need to succeed, okay? A valid test can generate highly positive washback. And by that, I mean, because this test <clears throat> helps us with diagnostics and helps us with various skill-related tasks, from a teaching perspective, we also now know how to change our teaching, all right? And what areas do we need to change in assessing going forward? Similarly, I, and I've been stressing this quite a lot right through the session today, is to tell you about how it finally prepares someone for, real, for the real world, particularly with regards to communication. And of course, um, there are additional skills that all these, uh, exam, these tasks help bring out. Which brings us to look at a little bit about how the tasks are constructed in the course of this exam. So, like I mentioned, in case you've joined us a little later, uh, there are two, um, two modules, or rather four skills. Reading, writing is one module, and speaking and listening is the second module. In the case of module one, reading and writing, you essentially have four areas to cover. You have long reading, you have multi-text reading. You have a very interesting task called reading into writing. And I'll show you talk about that as well. And of course you have extended writing. And similarly, in the case of the speaking task, you have a topic discussion, okay? But then you have a collaborative task where there is, we're working together with, or you're working with the examiner in being able to generate meaning, all right? Um, you also have a conversational task. And finally, of course, you have a regular independent listening task. Now, let's look a little bit at the reading. This is the long reading. So in the long reading, you can see there's about five paragraphs over there with perhaps an image. And then, of course, you have a set of questions, 15 questions to be precise. And each of those questions help or rather require you to use different skills in being able to find the right material. And I will show you a summary of that at the end. But it's, sorry, essentially what it's gonna ask you to do is very often in the context of the reading task, you're gonna either be reading to get a global gist summary, or you're going to be reading to, to, to scan, scan and search line-wise for a particular word, all right? Or very often you're gonna be reading and you're gonna come across new words which require to, you to have the ability to infer the meaning or to, can, or to derive what you think the meaning is based on the way the sentence is laid out. And all of these get validated and checked uh, as you will see. Uh, so in the case of the long reading, these are some of the skills that you will develop to scan, where you're reading for specific detail, to skim, which means almost like speed reading, where you're reading for general detail, Okay, reading for gist, which is for overall meaning, inferring, predicting, deducing meaning from the context, the way it's constructed, note taking, all right, proofreading and editing because you need to respond back. And sometimes you're mining very closely to see 
what could also be written between the lines, so to speak. Now in the real world, we can see that you will apply this if you're doing any sort of academic research, if you are doing, if you are reading an article or a newspaper or doing certainly a lot of web-based research that we see today, it's no longer about finding all your material in one place. Very often we use the verb Google, but essentially that means opening multiple tabs and then sourcing information from different links as we go along. And just the ability to do that is a skill and it needs to be developed. <clears throat> Not everybody has it naturally. Uh, now, in the case of multi-text reading, you can see that we use over here four different kinds of texts, all right? And one of them would be an infographic. Now, again, why is this test so relevant? Because learners today, all right, and the way their brain is constructed and the way their neural pathways are developed keeps changing every 10 years. So undoubtedly, while you and I may perhaps enjoy a nice broad spread uh, newspaper, our young learners and children today are consuming <clears throat> their reading material through multiple formats, all right? Some of it on a phone, some of it through a blog, some of it through a magazine, some of it through an ebook, some of it through pictures and hoardings and um, various other pictorials, um, and some of it through uh, uh, literally general interest articles. So they're reading from multiple media, they're reading in multiple ways, and hence, we needed to develop this task to truly help assess for how they're doing it. So again, similarly, post this particular, uh, the multi-text reading, there are another 15 questions that you must answer, all right? And similarly, when it comes to the writing task, there is a very interesting task, which is called reading into writing, which means if just to go back, task one was long text reading, Task two was multi-text reading, which you're reading for multiple texts. And then task, the writing module starts with using the earlier multiple texts to form that as your basis of research. And then you produce some writing related to you doing some research from the earlier task, which is why this is another unique aspect about our assessment, which is why we call it reading into writing, because in the real world, you will read first before you presumably write. So um, then of course comes um, the, the long task of writing, which is essentially extended writing, where here, depending on the particular level that you are at, you would have a variety of um, a different um, length of response that you're required to produce. So in a nutshell, all right, when you talk about the reading into the writing task, Look at the amount of things that you're learning. You're learning to plan at a macro level. Why? Because part of it requires you, all right, to actually create notes. If you see where my mouse is hovering, all right, is there is a particular area where you just work on your rough notes, which are not part of the exam set. Pro level there's discourse management. You're going to be proofreading because you will want to go back and read what you wrote. You're going to be editing because you're going to be choosing certain parts from uh, part A or part B or part C. Um, similarly, you're going to be summarizing. You're going to be paraphrasing. All right, now I've left the real life applications blank because there are just too many to mention over there. But these are things that we do every day in our workplace as well. So this was the extended writing that I spoke about. So in a nutshell, if you look at the reading and writing uh, tasks, these are all the skills that you develop. In the case of the long reading, I mentioned there were 15 questions. So questions one to five require you to skim, scan, and read for gist. Questions six to 10 require you to distinguish the principal statement and supportive examples. Questions 11 to 15, require you to do some comparing, evaluating, and inferring. So you see how well structured these exam tasks are, is not only are you getting an exam, but you're also getting an exam that teaches you how to be a better user of these skills. So in the case of the multi-text reading, again, this is the one with uh, four different texts or three different texts, depending on the level. Questions one to five require skimming, scanning, gist. 
questions 6 to 10 again require you to be able to distinguish and questions 11 to 15 require you to do some comparison and some evaluating and inferring. When it comes to the reading into writing, this is what I mentioned, most importantly, you have to mine your data, which means you must be able to pick out what is pertinent for you to use. What is just the right thing uh, that you're looking for to justify why you're writing something. Uh, and then these are the other various skills that are associated with this. So all in all, you can see it's a very interesting um, assessment thus far. Now, when it comes to the listening part, again, in the independent listening, which means where something is played for you and you're just listening and taking notes, there, there are a couple of skills that you need that you will develop. One is intensive listening, where you're looking for detail. It's a lot like scanning, where you're looking for that word, except that now you're doing it with your ears. And of course, there's extensive listing where you can finally, by listening to the old thing in general, you can say, okay, so this whole article meant basically this in one sentence, all right? And of course, looking, listening to certain words and, and hearing where they were placed, you can deduce meaning, you can infer and you can predict as well. So when we look at the speaking tasks, there's the topic phase, the collaborative task at the higher grades, and there's a conversation task. Now, if one was to look at the skills involved over here, it's very similar to what we've been talking about earlier, because here very often you're going to be inferring, okay, they're speaking into listening. So you're also going to be summarizing, you're going to be paraphrasing, and you're going to use interactive strategies. What does that mean? It means that you're, when you're discussing with the examiner, you're going to be learning or using ways to increase your interactivity, whether it's in the form of framing questions, in the form of um, uh, agreeing, or in the form of uh, ag agreeably disagreeing. Uh, these are all different skill sets that need to be learned. All right. Um, so in the speaking and listening, if you recall in the very first slides, I mentioned the length of the, uh, of the exam for speaking and listening varies. Here you can see in the case of the A2 level, it's a total of 12 minutes, all right? Uh, and it varies as you go higher and it comes as much as 25 minutes when you're in, your, in IC3. Now, how do these tasks, or why, why are these, what, are the, what is new, or what is so cool about the uh, speaking and listening module? In the case of the topic task, the test taker prepares any topic of their choice, all right, for discussion with the examiner. So it's not something scripted. It's something that you choose that is of close, that you hold closely to your heart, that you believe is relevant, that you believe is, lives, is, a slide, is a side of you. Secondly, in the collaborative task, the examiner reads a prompt which creates an information gap. And this sets the scene for the test taker to then lead the discussion. So the examiner may read out something which requires you and you're not sh completely sure. So then you, as a, as a candidate, you then start asking a few questions. That's what we talk of the um, strategies for um, collaborative speaking. Um, similarly, in the conversation task, the examiner selects a topic from a list relevant to that level. And the test taker asks, I'd ask the test taker questions to start a conversation. So in one case, you're leading it. In another case, you're receiving it, all right? But the beauty of it is it's all something that's close to your heart or something that should be appropriate to the level of your learning. And similarly, in the independent listing task, the test taker listens to a factual listing text, such as a documentary, a lecture, or a talk, takes notes, and then reports orally to the examiner. That's where summarizing and paraphrasing comes in. Now, just to let you know, um, and just to recap, so the reading and writing has four different components. The speaking and listening has also four different components, three of which are common for all. And at the higher grades, you have the collaborative task, which brings us to how do we assess? So when we are assessing the speaking and listening, we're looking number one for communicative effectiveness, which means can you make meaning? Can you feel meaning? Two, we're looking at language control. We're looking at your delivery. We're definitely going to look at your interactive listening. That means how well were you listening and, sorry, were responding. And of course your ability to just listen in general. 
when it comes to reading and writing, we are looking at task fulfillment. Were you able to complete the task? All right. Were you able to read and then convert it into writing? Well, what was your organization and structure while you were reading and writing? All right. And similarly, what kind of language control do you have in terms of usage? Now, we also give you a diagnostic, which tells you how you fed alongside each of them. So organization and structure, you may have done really well, but you realize that your language control was not so good. So it becomes a great tool for further improvement as well. And similarly, when speaking and listening, we're gonna give you a diagnostic there also along these four parameters. End of end, this is how you would be measured, where you could have a distinction in reading, but a pass in writing and a merit in speaking and maybe a fail in listening. So it gives you individual parameters where for each of them, you have the option to score distinctions or thereabouts. So in a nutshell, two modules, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, all right? Uh, I want to just take a quick minute now and show you, um, this has got to do with the recognition of where Trinity stands vis-a-vis -vis English exams. Uh, this may come up in our discussion in the next few moments. Um, and you can see this is Trinity's language suite in pink. You all know about Jesse exams. And now these are the ISC exams. So how do they relate with an international standard? That is benchmarked or the framework that is used over here is the CEFR, which is the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. And that's benchmarked into pre-A1 level up to C2 level. And like I mentioned, ISE starts at A2. So if you do an ISE foundation assessment <clears throat> and you clear that with a distinction, it means that you are very good at being able to read, write, listen, and speak and importantly, the tasks that also involve the collaborative task or the listening task, as well as the reading into writing task. Okay. Um, similarly, um, this gives you an overview and this is a great slide to keep with you. So I suggest take a screenshot of it because it kind of tells you how our assessments line up with the international framework. Um, now, some of you may also be wondering where can I use this assessment because it's an English proficiency exam. So Trinity's ISC is used and recognized by 98% of universities in the UK, including the London School of Economics, UCL, um, King's College London, and so on. I am your mail, and I will be putting in all these links that give you details. In fact, even now, just in case you would like to know this in the chat box, I am putting in some of the recognitions that are available in other parts of the world. You could have a look at it there. Um, now, also sometimes what comes up in discussion is how does this compare with an IELTS exam? So as you can see on the right-hand side, that is how IELTS um, is benchmarked against the CEFR. And that is how Trinity's IC exam is also benchmarked against the CEFR. Now, this is just for the purpose of information. It's of course public information available on Trinity's website. Um, so you're very welcome to have a look at it over there. And of course, I will also be sharing this link with you. So that brings us to the end of this session and a chance for me to take questions and answer them as well. And of course, I've done this with a minute to spare. So thank you very much. I do hope this has been informative. I'm gonna stop sharing now so that I can actually um, help answer any questions that you may have. Renu, all yours. Thank you, Dale. Um, we don't have any questions on the chat box, so please do um, type in questions or in the quick Q&A section would be better actually. So are there any questions, teachers? By the way, teachers, please indulge me for a second. And if I say, please just type yes, so that I know that you are all awake. <laughs> I hope I didn't put you to sleep. If you yeah, I, I oh. will. Oh, there you go. Yes, they are awake. <laughs> then I will that. ask you a question while we wait for the others. Um, I wanted to find out about um, how do you sort of 
how do you ban students into into the different levels like how, how do you know which level a student should sit for so typically in all our syllabi even if you look very closely at our jesse syllabus mm -hmm. um the last pages have a band of can do statements associated with each and every grade now i would recommend that the cefr on their website all right when they mention for instance an a2 level there is a list of can do statements that are attached to your reading and writing abilities so can the student do this can a student do that so there's a quite an exhaustive list so i think as a teacher if you're going to try and um assess or pre assess a candidate uh it's firstly to see what they can do all right and to mark it then with what level of frequency how often can they do it is it consistently being able to do it and that i think will then pave the way for you to realize okay fine this is where it appears that they need to be put perhaps between this level so that if they're pushed a little bit they can go to the next level or go to the appropriate level higher okay great thank you and we have some questions can the students take isc exams online um, um, okay so let's answer that question quickly uh, yes the isc exam is a um, so it's still a center delivered exam uh which means that um your speaking and listening task will happen the way a jesse online exam happens through an exam center and your reading and writing task will also happen in a physical exam format uh through an exam center um just how soon we believe we can resume that that of course varies from market to market city to city um but i know in india for instance we're looking at conducting these exams as uh soon as maybe mid july or the end of july so um that should help um can students take okay i think we've answered that would this exam be relevant for a student who is planning to study in australia well so the best thing to do is um and actually this is something i really want to point out before i get into looking at some of these comparative examples um i want to tell you that preparing for an isc or preparing with an isc exam has uh, the isc syllabus has put out this wonderful thing called the scheme of work i'm just actually while i'm talking to you i'm going to try and google uh, pick it up from trinity's website uh if i could share it with you because um uh this actually will provide you a schemata for um for you to teach it's about each level of isc has about 80 hours of programming that you can use or oh, there it is so um i'm going to just try and find you i send you one particular link oops it's already downloading um the teachers what i'm going to try and do for you is i'm going to try and put these as links where you can download all of this um because the, the, this is a wonderful document that actually tells you as a teacher in fact i'm just going to try and pull it up and then share my screen with you um what exactly you can do as a teacher so it's not only an exam but it's a perfect way to also it guides you on how to teach for an exam of this level or what kind of work could you do in terms of uh student and class work um and that i think is really helpful so each level has almost about 80 hours worth of what we call scheme of work um so i'm just now just sharing with you um just as soon as it opens i'm going to share with you this document uh there it is uh just give me a moment please while i do a quick screen share there you go so you will see over here that this is now an 8 week course so if you were let's say a teacher uh and you can use this even if you're an existing english language teacher or you want to know how to teach then it gives you very very detailed information over here on on a monday what kind of material to use all right from group warm ups to exam introduction to student self evaluation what kind of activities what kind of resources what should be your learning aims all right now this is of course as you can see this is just week 1 okay on a monday below that monday is still continued and as i'm scrolling down you can see what to do on a tuesday all right so this is actually lesson planning all right of how to teach this and this is the only one and that's why i say so using isc irrespective of what other english exams you have to do in the world isc will help you prepare for any english exam all right and because we are literally the leading and perhaps most difficult english exam you can be very sure that if you can do one of our exams you will be able to crack any english exam in the world 
all right? So most importantly, this is the scheme of work. It's available for all the different levels, all right? And as you can see, this is running into 17 pages, all right? Over here, you would have noticed that. And this is just for ISC 1. There's one for ISC 2. There's another one for ISC 3, all right? So this becomes very, very helpful in being able to, um, uh, sorry, in being able to actually use to prepare your students for it. Um, the next question is, so yes, so coming back to the question of whether it can be used in Australia. So I am sharing with you a couple of links. In fact, it was there in the presentation, but I'm going to be putting in country-wise wherever ISC is uh, recognized. What you could also do, though, is always send out a mail to the university that you're applying to and say, I would like or I would like to know whether I can do Trinity's integrated skills in English exam. It is benchmarked at level so and so, and they will also give you a direct response to that. Um, in certain cases, does ISC replace IELTS in any area? Well, 98% of British universities would accept ISC, so you could definitely do ISC if you were going over there. In fact, the entire list that I've given you, recognitions of different countries and around the world, it's basically to tell you that you can use the ISC exam instead of the IELTS exam. But I want to just point out one thing, teachers, please. Um, so on an apples to apples comparison, it's both exams. But if one was looking as a teacher of how to prepare uh, with a scheme of work, um, the right way to not just passing an exam, but also what kind of skills to develop, then the ISC has a beautiful scheme of work, which I think is very, very helpful because you as teachers will get a lot of support in terms of what kind of learning materials to use and what kind of lesson planning to do. So you can take that 80 hour work, um, 80 hours of work and divide it across um, I don't know, the entire academic year of, let's say, 30, 35 lessons uh, of whatever length um, or twice a week and however you choose to do it. But essentially, you have an entire framework of what to teach. Um, I'm scrolling down. Um, can ISE qualification exempt you from having to sit for an IELTS? Yes, again, again, it depends on the university. You can always check with them. Uh, it is a possibility. Um, and... Uh, this, of course, would depend on the university, so you can check with them. That's why I'm giving you the list of recognition, so you can check that. Renu, can Dale give us a sample of a lesson plan for these grades, if possible? So I am going to send you a link um, in the mail, um, which has, um, I'll either try and put it into a Dropbox so that you can download that lesson plan from there, um, and you can actually then pick it up yourself, um, or I will try and point you directly to the URL where you can download it for yourself. So I hope that helps. Um, do you have past papers? Yes, there's plenty of stuff available over here. In fact, the beauty over here, and I'm just going to again go back online. I want to just take a moment to also take you through the website and show you what else you can actually find online. So uh, let me just share my page with you. So this is where you go. You'd normally click on our qualifications. You'd scroll down to integrated skills in English. Uh, this is where you can read about the ISC, all right, the different modules, a couple of videos to support you. Uh, the different levels, ISC Foundation A2, B1, all these are mentioned over here. Most importantly, now you see all these tabs over here. There's a lot of information here. So starting with levels and resources, you can see each one, okay? For instance, if you look at ISC Foundation, all right, there is the guide, which is the syllabus. Then there is reading and writing tasks. These are actual lesson plans, all right, and practice papers with notes and with answers as well, all right. Similarly, there are speaking and listening related tasks, all right. Um, as you can see, these are all these are all actually lesson plans, um, and of course there are videos of what happens um, in an exam. Okay, so all of this is available under um, each level of course. I just thought was over here um, and of course I went in. Now, in addition to that, you also have publisher resources. So various, many um, external publishers, okay, actually put in material like this. So if you can get this across from amazon.uk or anywhere else, then you can see these are already external publishers. Global ELT is one of them. I know Black Hat Productions is another. Um, Macmillan is also another publisher. Here's Black Cat, sorry, not Black Hat. Um, and there are a few others. 
So there are, of course, ready-made materials that you can always pick up and get yourself. Uh, I know over the course of time, I've picked up some of these myself, and I think they're very helpful. So that's just to let you know. Uh, in, additionally, if you're looking, for instance, where uh, you want to know um, a little bit about, sorry. Give me a second, please. If you also want to know things about recognition, I'm just taking you directly to the page. All right, this is where recognition is. The map that I was just not showing you, this is the ISE, IELTS, CEFR alignment chart. That's what I was sharing with you just now. Uh, here, if I click on where it's accepted in the UK, all right, so I'm just gonna click this, you will see. Now, this is a list of, this is literally what I mentioned, 98% of universities in the UK accept ISE uh, as the language exam proof, which means you would use it instead of the IELTS. And then alphabetically, all the universities in the UK and which levels of ISE they accept. These are colleges starting with A, then there is B and so on and so forth. So there's plenty of course to look at and I think it's a great resource to use. Yeah, thank you. There was a question about the Sri Lanka Center conducting ISE exams. And yes, we do. In fact, we had to, a couple of students sit for the ISE, both uh, speaking, listening and reading, writing a couple of months ago. Um, so the, the, the written exams are very frequent, in fact, the dates are much more frequent than the music, for example, written exams, which only happen twice or three times a year, but these ones happen almost every month daily, if I'm correct, I think the written exams are held almost every month. So whenever we do have entries, we can have the uh, exams. Um, and of course, it can't be a lockdown situation. That's the only other thing, because you have to come into the center. Um, and the uh, reading and I mean, the listening and speaking is uh, similar to the Jesse VC uh, option, the uh, video conference option. So you would come into our center and you would be uh, face to face on Zoom with an, a, an examiner like the Jesse exam. Okay, ISE plus ComSkills, UCAS points, do they provide better chances for students to get admitted in colleges? Yes, I would think so, because so the ISE exam is a language proficiency exam, which means you can, that's where you demonstrate that I have this level of language knowledge or language abilities. And um, com skills, drama, music, performance arts, those are vocational, vocational uh, qualifications. So hence they come under the UCAS system where you can actually use those things. So obviously if you have both, uh, then you would need it. Chances are in any case, if you were applying to a British university, uh, you definitely need a language exam. Um, it could be an IC for uh, in your case, uh, and of course the UCAS points would also add greater weightage. Uh, how can we get past papers? So I think there's a uh, there is well one of course is to look at whatever is available online on Trinity's website, uh, and like I mentioned, there were a couple of external publishers. Uh, you can pick up their books; they would ship it to you. I know they do that in the case of India, um, and um, you can of course have access to that. Um, and of course, some, some earlier teachers may also have access to these resources, so you can always ask around and you should be able to get them. Yeah, maybe we can help you with that as well. We'll, we'll see what we can do about past papers too. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're good. Um, Great. Yes, I think we've answered all the questions. Thank you so much, Dale, for spending uh, another Saturday afternoon with us. And thank you, teachers, for joining us. I hope you look at it. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. Um, I think you all have Dale's email as well as you have our email. So please do feel free. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Have a lovely weekend. Stay safe, of course, and be good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.